Hello, and welcome to this introduction to Fourier transforms and their application. We'll start off by reminding ourselves the function of an integral transform, which is to change a problem from one domain to another, usually to make it easier to solve. The Fourier transform relates to the domains of time and frequency. By mentioning frequency, that implies that we're going to be talking about sinusoids. So let's take a look at the basics of a sinusoid. Here's a graphical representation, and here's the equation describing it. The amplitude of the sinusoid is marked on the graph. And the time period, which is the time it takes for the signal to repeat itself, which is 1 over frequency, is also marked. The phase term relates to whereabouts on the cycle we start. A phase change of 360 degrees is one complete cycle. So as drawn, we have a phase of 0 degrees. If, however, we phase shift by 90 degrees, we can see the new green cosinusoid signal shown on the graph. Phase difference is important because of the way it impacts on interference. If we consider two separate sinusoids, which are in phase with one another, we have a 0 degree phase shift, we can see that the resultant of summing the two together is a double amplitude signal. But if we change the phase of one of those components, in fact, we allow the phase change to vary between 0 and 180 degrees, we can see that the signal which results from the interference of the two can diminish all the way to zero amplitude when they are exactly out of phase. This is particularly important because it is the interaction of the different components of a uh, Fourier transform that allow us to come up with the different shapes that we see in the time domain signal that we're looking to represent. One of the easiest ways of considering a Fourier decomposition is to look at approximating a square wave. A square wave is shown on screen, and the simplest approximation we can give is the sinusoid shown alongside it. We can see that at the zero crossing points, the signals are identical, but elsewhere there's quite a lot of variation. In fact, to get a better approximation, we could do with having a little more signal here and here, and a little bit less signal in the middle of the positive going excursion, with similar variation in the negative excursions. Conveniently, there's a signal which would give us that. That's a sinusoid with three times the frequency. But because we only need to make a moderate correction, we can reduce the amplitude. In fact, in this case, we're looking at the amplitude which is a third of that of the original sinusoid. When we add those two together, we get a slightly better approximation. Now, once again, we can see there are certain regions where we could do with adding a little bit more signal in, and some parts of the waveform where we could do with subtracting some off. If we now look at the shape of a sinusoid with five times the original frequency, we could see that accomplishes just those requirements. But again, because the approximations are a little bit less than we needed to make last time, or the corrections are a little less, we can use an amplitude that's smaller again. This time we have five times the frequency and one fifth of the amplitude of the original. If we add that to our previous approximation, we can see we get a better approximation again. And we can carry on repeating this process adding more and more components in. You can see as we add more and more components in, we get a sharper and sharper change on the leading and trailing edges. We also get a better approximation of the constant amplitude in the flat sections, and the amount of ringing that we see at the transition between zero to the uh, positive or negative going values is reduced. There is less overshoot. In fact, if we carried on adding an infinite number of sinusoidal components, we would get an almost perfect approximation of the original square wave. So now let's look at those components of a square wave in the two separate domains. In the time domain, we have our original time signal. And then if we look at the frequency components which we can use to reconstruct that, we see that we have the fundamental and then odd harmonic numbers, so 3, 5, 7, 9, and the amplitudes falling off as 1 over the harmonic. So the third 
uh, third component has 1 over 3 amplitude, the fifth component 1 over 5 amplitude. As we said, we would need an infinite number of components to accurately represent the signal, and that's exactly what Fourier's theorem states. We can say that any periodic waveform can be compiled up from the sum of an infinite number of spectral components. Each of those spectral components has its own magnitude and its own phase associated with it. It's also important to realize that time and frequency are inverse domains. We saw that from the time period equation previously, but because of that, that means anything that is wide in one domain is narrow in the other. Let's consider again a time and frequency representation of some signals. If we start with a sinusoidal signal, we can see that this carries on infinitely in time. Therefore, its frequency representation is infinitesimal, it's infinitely narrow, just a single spike, a delta function. If we now look at something that's a very short pulse in time, this has got a very broad, wide frequency spectrum with content at a wide range of frequencies. We can also look at conservation of energy and how that's impacted by the Fourier transform. We recall that energy is proportional to amplitude squared. So if we consider the amplitude squared in the time domain, we find that the sum of all the different amplitude components is equal to the sum of all the spectral amplitudes in the frequency domain, as long as we consider spectral amplitude squared. In the same way, we consider temporal amplitude squared. This is Parseval's theorem. However, because the Fourier transform has an implicit assumption that waveforms are periodic, we need to be careful. Consider the waveform shown here, and we'll remove the grid for clarity. Now, if this was a periodic waveform, we should be able to take another facsimile of this waveform and add it on. However, note that because there was a positive going excursion on the left hand edge of the waveform, whereas there was a negative going excursion on the right hand edge of the original waveform, where those two combine, we end up with a discontinuity. Now we saw when we were approximating a square wave that very sharp edges need many, many spectral components to be able to accurately represent those. And the converse is also true that if we have sharp edges that we don't want in our signal, we will introduce sources of errors at the higher frequencies. The way that we normally resolve this is to apply a window function. So again, Consider our sinusoidal section, and then we will multiply it by a window shape as shown here in orange. This has the effect of reducing the amplitude at the edges to zero. Now, if we consider the waveform to be periodic and put another copy alongside, we can see that we've got continuity. We have none of those sharp edges. And so we've been able to resolve all of the additional erroneous information at higher frequencies. However, in the process of applying the window, we've had to, had to reduce some of the energy in some of the components. As we start to look at the effect of window functions, we see we have this constant playoff between minimizing the amount of high frequency energy and reducing energy in total. So let's look at a few different window functions. The window function shown in blue is the rectangular window function. This, in essence, is just simply truncating a waveform at any point we choose. Whereas you'll see that many of the other window shapes taper to zero or near zero at the edges. Now let's have a look at those in the frequency domain. We can see there are a number of differences in their spectral responses. Of most importance, we note that the rectangular window, which is not multiplied by anything other than unity, has the largest signal amplitude. And it also has the narrowest primary lobe. The primary lobe width is a measure of how much we may be blowing energy about any central spike. If we look at lots of the other window functions, we can see that they have a broader primary lobe. But their big difference is that the height of other secondary and tertiary lobes 
is dramatically reduced. And if we take an example of looking at the dark blue window function, which is shown here in the time domain waveform, and here with its relevant spectrum, we can see that the amplitude of the side lobes is always at least 50 dB more than the peak amplitude of the primary lobe. We've suppressed any effect of side lobe energy to at least 50 dB below the fundamental. Let's now go on to talk about convolution. If we have a system with a system function, h of t, and we apply an input x of t to it, we'll get an output. And that output is given by what we call a convolution. This is the interaction of the input signal with a whole series of time reflected variants of the system function at a range of different time delays. And the output is actually the sum up of all of the different time delays possible. This is commonly written as a star to indicate the convolution. This abstract mathematical method is sometimes difficult to visualize. So let's look at this in practice. We'll start off with a system function, h of t, and a drive function, an input function that's applied to it. Remember that convolution required us to reflect the uh, system function in the time axis, which we've now done. And the start of that reflected signal is shown as a dotted line. As we start to slide, a system function corresponding to all those separate delays, we can see that when we have a situation where we have uh, more and more of the positive going excursion, we have an increase in the output signal. But once we start to see negative going excursion in the input signal, then eventually we get to a point where we now have zero output or zero on our output because the size of the positive and the negative going excursions as averaged under the system function ht equal each other and cancel out. It's only when the system function's delay starts to interact with the trailing edge and the, we start to see the contribution from the input function and trailing edge interaction, we see more signal. And once we get to a point where the system function is no longer interacting with any part of the input time signal, we can see that we now have zero again. So we can see here, it's the interaction of that different time delayed components of the system function with that input function, which result in our output. Convolution is often expressed in the frequency domain. If we use a capital letter to indicate a Fourier transformed variable, then we find that if we look at the time domain representation of convolution, its frequency domain representation is much simpler. Rather than having that integral combination, it simply becomes a multiplication of spectra. And therefore, we could, if we wanted to, conduct the convolution operation by Fourier transforming each of our input and system functions, multiplying those spectra together, and then inverse transforming to achieve the result. Now, this seems like a number of extra stages. and You may be questioning why we'd want to do that. The answer lies in the computational efficiency. If we undertake a Fourier transform with a fast Fourier transform or FFT routine, we find that it typically requires n log to the base two of n calculations where n is the number of points in a trace. If we're looking at a system function and an input function, both of which are n points long, and for the sake of argument, we'll let n be 1024, we find we've got just over 10,000 operations to Fourier transform the input signal another 
little over 10,000 operations to Fourier transform the system function. The multiplication of those two spectra is one for each point, so we have a little over 1,000 for our multiplication operation. And then to inverse Fourier transform, we can again use the FFT algorithm, so just over 10,000 operations. The total count is 3 log to the base 2 n plus 1. So nearly 32,000 operations to do this convolution operation via Fourier techniques. If, however, we use a time domain deconvolution, we have to multiply the system functions for each of the thousand different possible delays. So we have 1,024 times 1,024, which is over 1 million calculations, n squared calculations. We can say, therefore, that by using the FFT routing, we are able to reduce a million mathematical operations to about 32,000. This saving becomes larger as n increases. In fact, this becomes really useful when we start to consider deconvolution. So imagine we have a system function, h of t. The hydrophone experiences a pressure and produces a voltage. What we'd really like to know is the pressure. And in practice, the known quantities are the calibration of the hydrophone, the system function, and the voltage that we get on its output. What we would like to find is that pressure input signal. So let's look at that voltage to pressure conversion process. Here we can see the voltage is the convolution of the system function and the input function. So we take Fourier transforms of both sides. We divide the voltage by the system function, the calibration of the hydrophone, and then we inverse Fourier transform. In fact, because the system function is often expressed in the frequency domain, we don't even need to Fourier transform that one. All we need to do is Fourier transform the voltage signal, which is the output from the system, divide by our calibration spectra, and then inverse Fourier transform to get the input pressure signal. Spectral domain representations are also useful if we're looking to try and identify noise. Consider here the two waveforms shown on screen. Visually, they look identical. However, if we consider the spectral representation, for the upper signal, we can see that the uh, spectral peak at 0 dB amplitude has then got very little other signal and the remainder of the spectrum is more than 300 decibels below the spectral peak's amplitude. However, if we look at the, the FFT of the second signal, we can see that the noise floor is considerably higher. And although in this case the noise, signal to noise ratio is still very high, we'd be unable to discern that noise in practice by looking at the tone domain signal. In the frequency domain, we can clearly see the impact of that additional spectral content. So, in summary then, a Fourier transform decomposes any periodic signal into sinusoids, each of which has its own magnitude and phase. Window functions reduce processing errors that need to be chosen carefully. And Fourier transforms may allow massive computational savings, particularly when we're looking at convolution operations. We hope you found this interesting. If you did, come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial videos.